So today I'll be talking about the Procrastinator's Guide to a Data Science Career. And it's important to note that a title is not uh, how to get a job in data science, so another common question, because it's very difficult to answer that. You need to know a lot about the, a particular person. Uh, rather, what I'm going to talk about is what I do as a data scientist, uh, how I got there, and what along the way worked for me. So I'm a data scientist at Stack Overflow. If you program, you've probably run into Stack Overflow before. It's a question and answer site for, um, for programming. So if you search a question, you find, you find an answer. And uh, I'm one of the two data scientists that works here. And what I do as a data scientist, well, this is a Venn diagram uh, created by Drew Conway, representing a data science as the intersection of three kinds of skills. You have uh, hacking skills, programming, the ability to work with the database. You have math and statistics knowledge, and that includes uh, inference and probability, and, uh, um, and you have substantive expertise, and that involves uh, communication skills. It involves maybe um, uh, knowing, knowing uh, facts about a business or about a particular domain that you work with. And, and uh, if you just put together hacking and, and a programming and, and statistics, you might work in machine learning. If you put together math and statistics with some um, substantive uh, understanding of your field, you can get traditional scientific research. Uh, but if you really, and if you um, just uh, are able to program and you know about your area, but you don't have any training in math or statistics, you, that's what we call the danger zone, uh, where you're probably not, um, where you might get into trouble because you're, you're able to answer a lot of questions but not to understand the statistics and um, how to distinguish uh, signal from noise. That's why majoring in statistics and, and understanding statistics early on is so powerful. And if you combine all these skill sets together, you get data science. Another way of putting it uh, that I really like by Josh Willis is that a data scientist is someone who's better at statistics than any software engineer and better at software engineering than any statistician. We think of it in these terms because, uh, because when you work in technology, we sort of think of a continuum between scientists and, engin and uh, engineers. If you have a, the most extreme kind of scientist you could be would be, a, um, would be an academic, someone who works um, in, a, uh, in a PhD or as a professor, and the other uh, uh, doing academic research. And the opposite extreme might be someone who programs, builds websites. To go a little farther down the spectrum from a scientist, you get what we often call a type A data scientist, a meaning uh, analysis. That'll be someone who works a lot with statistical inference and visualization, someone who is able to really explore data and come up with conclusions, uh, but would tend to work for a company, would be someone who um, works for, uh, uh, would say analyze data for a, fi for a company's um, marketing and biz, uh, business teams to understand what choices they could make. You go a little farther down and you get to what we sometimes call a type B data scientist, and that would be someone who builds product features using data science. So that would include building things with machine learning, using big data to understand enormous sets of, say, visits to a website, uh, and so on, uh, and then for, uh, so, Usually what we find, what I've found is that people that come from an academic background will be, uh, tend to kind of become type A data scientists, whereas people that start as software engineers uh, tend to become type B data scientists. Uh, by, and either way, you're learning some skills and moving one direction on the spectrum. One other way of thinking of it is that some of you are already, uh, many of you I, I saw on the poll before are doing academic research and probably already are doing some data science. Uh, what I'd say is if you build things to help answer questions, that would make you a, a, da a data scientist in academia. Whereas a data scientist in industry would tend to answer questions to help build things. There's a lot of skill overlap with sort of a different goal. In one area, we might, they might, you might be really interested in publishing a paper with some of your conclusions, but in industry, we'd usually be saying, how can we use this to build some kind of product? So the specifics of what I would do as a data scientist would be answer questions relative to our um, to our business. So the, the um, this, for example, is a uh, we have an email chain where people regularly send us emails and ask um, and a request for the data team to come up with some uh, with uh, 
solutions to particular problems. An example is that a, um, uh, earlier this year, someone wanted to know, uh, one of our, our marketing team wanted to know what kinds of companies they could go after based on ha what has links on our site Stack Overflow with developer dot, because that usually would be uh, websites that are the kind of audience that we're, that we're advertising to. So we would run through, do an analysis and provide this to them with some, with some uh, possibly with scientific and statistical context and answer a question that helps the marketing team generate leads. Another thing we would do is build product features that rely on machine learning. And a lot of the time that means uh, ad targeting and recommendations engines. An example is that on Stack Overflow, we advertise jobs to people, uh, to, you know, to, to software developers and programmers, and we target them to, to the kinds of people that, um, based on the kinds of que Stack Overflow questions that people visit. So for example, I visit a lot of things related to R and data science, which means that when I get job advertisements, because of these systems that I help build, we, I get jobs in, um, related to, uh, to R and to data science. Another thing that, and my favorite part really of being a data scientist is that we get to share interesting analyses with the world. One example is a tool we released this year where we can look at the growth of various programming languages. As, um, as undergrad statisticians, I imagine some of you use Python, some use R, uh, so you might use Matplotlib or ggplot2 for visualization, and we can look at how these technologies have grown in terms of Stack Overflow questions in that month. And this is a public tool that you can go use and explore some things about what technologies are growing and shrinking. And we use that to build a lot of uh, really interesting uh, blog posts uh, in these analyses that you can find at a uh, stackoverflow.blog slash insights about all of these things that we, um, we can find by exploring our data. So uh, one that I came out just this week was what are the most disliked programming languages based on ones that, keep, that our users had put on their profile as technology they don't want to work with. In recent months, I've looked at the growth of R, I've looked at the growth of Python, and it's really rewarding to get to share these analyses with the world, uh, especially since it kind of fits the, um, as I'll get into a bit my own background in, um, in, in, in science and academics where I, got to, where I got to tell these stories. And lastly, uh, so, oh, it's one specific example I've list of uh, interesting ones we can share. In April, we shared what programming technologies tend to be used late at night based on ones that are visited. And we were able to see that particular ones, uh, some of our programming languages were visited much more in the middle of the day and some much more in the evening. We create a little animation where we can see that Excel questions, they're really visited by people working nine to five jobs. They spike around, watch your comment, Dawn, nine o'clock, and Excel goes up, VBA, uh, some uh, other technologies, including R, that spike a lot during the day, whereas other programming languages, um, one called Haskell, that's used a lot by, um, by hobbyists and, um, and academics, that, uh, that really spikes during the late evening and nighttime. So, we've, so you can find that online at our, um, at our blog as well. So that's the kind of things that, uh, that data scientists do. And, uh, and I'm very lucky to have the job. I've been here for two years and four months, and uh, I'd like to share the story of how I got this job. I got the job directly out of my PhD. I did it in, um, at Princeton in computational biology. And what, the reason I got it is I'd been engaging with Stack Overflow for a really long time before I, wor I worked here. And the way I've been, I'd been engaging with it is asking, uh, is answering people's questions. Back in January 2012, uh, there was, I saw a Python question where someone wanted to ask a particular Python problem. And at that point, I signed up and, and, uh, and, and, and that was the first question that I'd ever answered. Uh, and I quickly started answering a bit more. So that was for, that was on January 5th, and then I answered a bunch on January 6th, and on January 8th, and 9th, and 10th, and 11th. And I just kept, I just, uh, for a couple of weeks, I kept answering questions. And if you look back and say, why did I go from zero to 60 so quickly? And I'll tell you the reason. It's that my qualifying exam for my PhD was on January 24th. 
and I was procrastinating. I was, uh, I had something really urgent coming up in the next couple of weeks and I instead decided what I would do is go and answer other people's programming questions for basically no reason. I continued even after my general exam and ended up answering a couple of um, several hundred questions largely about the Python and R programming languages that I tend to use. And after all these hundreds, um, these hundreds of questions that I've been answering, um, after many years, I answered this one uh, in 2013 about the intuition behind a particular statistical concept, the beta distribution. So I answered this question of um, what's the intuition behind it, and I gave an explanation um, of uh, baseball statistics, of, of the beta distribution based on the area of baseball statistics. So it ended up being a somewhat popular um, answer, but of course the reason I wrote it on uh, January 15th, 2013 is that it was the day before presenting at a lab meeting and I hadn't even started my slides. So I, uh, I got this out there and then it, it was, somewhat, uh, was somewhat popular and it was uh, high up on some Google uh, results, which meant that one, that, uh, one of my now uh, data, the data engineers at Stack Overflow said uh, why I love working here is we get awesome answers to questions like this one. And he followed it shortly up with a tweet right at me saying, I know we're not exciting as, as exciting as finishing your PhD, but if you want an interview here, you can have one. And at the time I visited the office just to kind of, um, uh, I, was, I was a few months from finishing my own PhD, but I visited the office just for fun and a few uh, interviews and um, later I signed a contract and I, um, and I joined. I later learned uh, what the conversation had been like behind the scenes where somewhat they'd been trying to look up the beta distribution. Uh, someone inside shared my answer and the reply just was, uh, wow, what if we just hired that guy? So this was a freak accident. It was, it was, it's a freak accident I think about a lot because I got my job by being a procrastinator. And this is why I said earlier on, I can't, um, I can't say how to get a job. I can only say what worked for me. And what worked for me, not just in this instance, but a lot of times in my life, is the fact that I'm a terrible procrastinator. And that's why I called my talk The Procrastinator's Guide to a Data Science Career. It's sort of the only thing I'm qualified to give advice on. But if you are a procrastinator, I've got this, I've got this down uh, to a science because you could boil it down to three pieces of advice I'd give to a procrastinator trying to succeed in statistics and data science. And these three are first to use a practice called structured procrastination that has uh, changed my life. Second is sharpening your saw, which involves improving, means spending time to improve your own skills. And the third is doing work in public. So I'll explore each of these. First is structured procrastination. If you haven't read this article by John Perry, it's really exceptional. How to procrastinate and still get things done. Really changed my life because uh, it, it's really about a strategy for, um, for uh, getting things done as a procrastinator. And uh, since then, I like to think I'm someone who gets a good amount uh, done. So I do have a job, and it certainly keeps me busy. But I've also, I'm also able to um, to maintain a large number of open source projects uh, within the as um, R packages, things that uh, sets of R tools that other people can use. I also keep up a blog pretty actively, um, a couple of blog posts a month. Uh, earlier this year, I released uh, my first in-print book, uh, Text Mining with R with O'Reilly. Uh, so that, um, that came out uh, this summer. If you're interested in text mining, I certainly recommend it. And I also um, released earlier in the year an e-book, Introduction to Empirical Bayes. So that's available uh, electronically for pay, pay what you want. And it's based on... Um, and it's, uh, it, if you're interested in the practice of empirical Bayes, uh, it's uh, in terms of baseball statistics, that, uh, that's really an expanded uh, version of the answer I gave before. And I still keep up a lot of Stack Overflow answering, and uh, I'm an enormous fan of DataCamp, which does statistical uh, and uh, R and Python education, and I've built two courses with them so far this year, with a third one coming out next week. So I do think I, I'm able to 
do a lot of things, which is really weird considering how much of a procrastinator I am. If you search my inbox for sorry for the delay, you get really a large number. So, so uh, how can you get a lot done even if, if you're really bad at doing things you're supposed to? Let me talk about someone who, gets, who got a lot more done than me. President Dwight D. Eisenhower. Uh, so he was, pres uh, he was president there from 1953 to 61. Uh, and you might know that, but did you know he's also he was supreme uh, commander of the um, of Europe during um, and after World War II. He was the president of Colombia. He was chief of staff of, of the army. He was an incredibly has a solid claim to being the most productive person of the 20th century. And he had a particular philosophy that organizational experts refer to as the Eisenhower decision matrix. It's about splitting up what is urgent and not urgent from what is important and not important. If something is both urgent and important, you do it now. If it's not urgent, but it is important, you schedule a time to do it in the future. If something is urgent, uh, but it's not important, it needs to get, it needs to get done soon, uh, you, uh, but it's, it's not a particularly important task, you can delegate it, find someone else to do it. And if it's neither urgent nor important, you don't do it, you drop it. This is a really good piece of advice and it makes a lot of sense. A lot of very productive people like CEOs uh, are able to structure their lives around it. It doesn't work for me. It doesn't come close to working for me. And it's because of the giant differences between me and Eisenhower. Eisenhower was an incredibly organized person. I am an astonishingly disorganized person. It's really hard to get farther apart. Eisenhower won World War II, which is something I definitely would have put off doing. The reason it's, it's so bad is that we, um, is that for someone like me, if you have a to-do list, uh, whatever is at the top of the to-do list, most important, I'm not going to do in a million years. But whatever is at the bottom of the to-do list, what I know, I, I don't need to do that uh, now. We would do that, do that for a long time. Uh, it's just uh, that's what I have the absolute impulse to work on. So that means it's really, uh, if, if, you, if I tried that strategy, I'd be fighting myself. So I'd like to offer the procrastinator's decision matrix for people like me. This is based on the philosophy described in, um, it's my own way of explaining the philosophy described in John Perry's How to Procrastinate and, and Get Things Done uh, article. Story is, if something is not, if something is not urgent, uh, not important, but is urgent, procrastinate doing it. So a really good example is, um, is when I had to submit an abstract for this talk that I'm giving right now. Uh, the, um, uh, the, uh, the, the organizer, Kelly McConville, asked, told me, you can, um, told me there's no rush on this, but let's pl but please get it in by August 15th. And I know from experience that if I get it, uh, so I had an urgent deadline, but I knew from experience that if I pushed that deadline, I'd still get to give the talk and probably no one would, would um, be that bothered. So that was a perfect thing to keep in my mind, sorry Kelly, to keep in my mind as something that I needed to do but I wasn't doing. That was why I procrastinated. And that gave me an opportunity to do important but not urgent things. This is a way of hacking your brain to say, do something that, um, that uh, uh, let's do something that is very important to your life but doesn't have a firm deadline on it. An example is writing a book. If I, uh, at any point in the last year, decided to simply push my book off, it w no one would have come uh, chasing after me. It just wouldn't have gotten published. Another good example is a PhD dissertation. Uh, I was able to graduate on time because I, uh, a thesis is rarely urgent, even though it's always important. So if you go into grad school uh, as a procrastinator, it can work better than you might expect. What do you do when something's both urgent and important? Well, you have to get an extension. This is why procrastinators make poor doctors, poor soldiers, and poor CEOs. Jobs where there are regularly lots of urgent things, of both urgent and important tasks that are arriving. And what do you do if something is neither urgent nor important? You know what? You do it anyway. Because just like the answer to the Stack Overflow question, sometimes it turns out that in the law, that, um, that if you're tempted to do it, even if you can't think of an immediate reason to do it, it turns out being useful in the long term. 
So that this is the um, the guide to getting things done as a procrastinator, and it's largely what, what I've been able to find uh, uh, works well for doing data science work. To do, um, and we'll get into a few reasons for that in the next two, uh, why it's particularly suited to statistics and data science in the next two points. The second point is sharpening your saw. This is one of my favorite cartoons, the idea of someone with a square wheel that decides they don't have the time to replace the square wheels with round wheels because they're too busy. I think this is, um, this really gets at a, um, it really gets at, at, I think, a myth that we're taught early on that how much work you get done each day depends on how hardworking you are. Uh, that it's really all about either you're lazy and you get a little work done each day or you're hard work and you get a, um, more work done each day. The truth is that the graph looks a little more like this. If you spend time each day learning and, are able, and improving your skills so you're able to better um, do your work, you speed up every single day. Uh, and, the, um, and that's important even when you think that you don't have the time to do so. A good example is that uh, is making these exact plots. I only learned how to do it. These are like XKCD style plots. I only learned how to do it a few hours before I finished this presentation. Because, uh, and uh, set up this code for creating that last slide. I learned at the last minute because then it counts as procrastinating. It's a chance to trick yourself into improving one of your skills, even though you're actually just, um, uh, either what you're really doing is you're pushing off something that is uh, urgent. So it fits perfectly into that part of, um, of um, learning is very important, but it's rarely urgent, really, that you have anyone telling you to do so it right now. So there's another step to this. It's really good to learn, to constantly improve your own skills, but it's even better to learn how to learn. It's better to spend time improving your own ability to, uh, to learn because then you start improving at a, uh, at a quadratic rate. You can start improving at a, uh, at a rate where every day you're able, to, um, you're able to improve your skills a little bit faster. And at and that strategy, even if it takes up a lot of your time, will end up dominating every other one in the long term. So what do I mean by getting faster at learning? So a couple specific examples uh, for uh, statisticians, data scientists, is learn to code. There's really no way around this. My favorite uh, ref quote from this is from Hadley Wickham, a notable R package developer, is he said that um, improving your programming skills is a force multiplier. Once you've solved the problem once, code allows you to solve it faster in the future. And this is a way to really get exponential gains in terms of, um, of solving a problem and continuing to solve it uh, over and over and keep um, speeding that up. My general opinion on learning to code is it should be taught in basically every, um, in, in any undergraduate statistics curriculum. I think there's an unfortunate tendency in, a, in um, some undergraduate communities to think that data science and statistics are the same, are sort of the same thing. They don't have to teach data science. And as a result, they underemphasize programming. So I'd certainly say prioritize coding as part of your um, education. Another is to build a network. So one of the things that I, um, I run into a lot of problems that I don't know how to solve, and I tweet about them. I, and I have a, a number of followers and, um, and uh, colleagues that are able to help me with these problems that I run into because I've built them up. That's a way of improving my rate of improving my own knowledge is get to know uh, smart people that can, um, that can help you build these skills. So Twitter is my personal way of doing it. I think Twitter has an amazing statistics and data science community on it, uh, especially around R, which is where I do a lot of the R programming languages, where I do a lot of my uh, work and community building. But, uh, but there's a lot of other approaches for it, including uh, blogging or within your local department. Another way is using version control. Uh, so, so Git and uh, GitHub are a way of... Um, tracking your work so you can find your old, uh, you can, you can uh, incrementally increase it, find your own work well, and collaborate well. This is something that, uh, that takes a little bit of time to, to get some practice with. I'm not sure how common it is, um, say, among a community like uh, the undergraduate one I'm, I'm speaking to, but it really, it incredibly pays off in terms of being able to improve your ability to improve your own code. 
Another is reproducible research. Reproducible research is the practice of building reports that can easily be um, regenerated. So uh, instead of, say, doing your homework by, uh, by, um, by creating graphs in one, in one uh, in one R console and, and analyzing them and then putting them into a um, word do into a word document, it's instead creating just one document get that gets generated automatically uh, with uh, R markdown. This is maybe this is incredibly powerful um, technology. I'd really recommend, especially if you are looking into R markdown. And it's uh, it's easier than it looks. Uh, the um, uh, what I'd say really is that uh, it might look when you start it out it might look challenging, but it turns out really to be uh, pretty, pretty, uh, uh, pr uh, pretty easy in the long run. So my general way I'd summarize these, these conclusions is that um, a lot of you it look, looks like are considering graduate school. I think that's a great idea. Graduate school is is the best opportunity to sharpen your saw that I know of because five years where your main job is to improve your own skills. So everybody gets good at something. So uh, if, you do, do, if you do a PhD, really think about what do you want to get good at? You can get good at just copying and pasting a particular type of data, uh, data between a few files uh, and, say, um, and, and manually annotating things, or you can improve your skills at coding and be able to solve problems in the future no matter what you face. The last uh, component to my uh, recommendations is to do public work. While I was in graduate school um, and doing undergraduate research, I usually thought of my goals this way. I thought of a spectrum of progress where uh, I would start with an idea that wasn't very valuable. I'd build preliminary results in a draft manuscript, and I'd keep getting closer to what I needed to do. And then finally, I'd publish. I'd finally, I'd complete the manuscript, and I was almost there. And then I would publish a paper. And I really realized that was the wrong way to think about it. The right way to think of it is anything that still lives on your computer is approximately worthless. No one else in the world can use it. You might lose it if you just uh, if you uh, forget your computer. Other people don't know don't know about it. It's uh, worthless. The only thing that matters is things that make the jump from uh, to being out there in the world, and that's true if it's a uh, if it's a published paper. But it's also true if it's a, um, a preprint. It could be a, uh, a it could be a blog post of an analysis you did. It could be an open source project of the tools that you built. It could just be a tweet about something something interesting that you did. But a tweet about uh, just a, a one short little thing with an interesting graph that you made is worth much more than an enormous amount of analysis on your laptop that you never get that you never share with the world. So this is um, some of the ways that are really important, I mentioned uh, preprints, uh, is a really important way to, um, to if, once you start looking for jobs. So a lot of you either do research or are planning on um, graduate school. So once you have manuscripts, you really, you absolutely do not want to just say that you're working on a manuscript if you, uh, when you're looking for jobs. You want to have them as preprints published online, uh, even though they're not in a peer-reviewed journal, so that other people can see them. Two good uh, sit, uh, places for doing that is for mathematics and uh, physics and computer science research. Archive is a fantastic space for doing that. If you work in biology, like I did, we have bioarchive. And there are other approaches to it. There are places where even if, if you're not quite ready to submit, say if you submit it to a journal, but it's not accepted yet, or you're not quite ready to get to a journal, but you want to go on the job market, it's a really good way of putting your work out there. And the great thing about it is that it tightens the feedback loop, uh, which is really important for a procrastinator like me. It gets to a point where if you're writing something, you can, um, uh, it'll lead to some immediate satisfaction. It's out there in the world. People are talking about it. You're able to see the response, and it's able to get to make you pretty excited. And as a result, it's a way to encourage you to work more. Once I started writing, in, uh, I would, as a, I really used to procrastinate writing more than anything else. I hated writing. Uh, but once I started being able to, uh, to put it out in the world and get immediate feedback on it, it's now one of my favorite things to do. And the truth is that peer review uh, within the academic process is a terrible feedback loop. There's a huge gap between when a manuscript gets submitted and when it gets accepted. So um, I definitely say stay. I'd, uh, 
I'd say you, it's a peer-reviewed manuscript is an important part of the process, but if it's the only thing you get out of a paper, uh, it's going to be very challenging to encourage yourself to work on it. So I'd recommend uh, preprints. I really recommend blogging. When I do an interesting analysis, I just put it out immediately on a blog. It's not peer-reviewed. It's not going to. It won't go on my resume, but it's a way to get it out there. Or if it's something small and simple, like a neat probability puzzle that you're able to solve, uh, get it out there in a tweet. It can be something um, really short. It would never be a paper. It can't even be a blog post. But it's something out of the world, and you're able to get immediate feedback on it. Last point I'd make about public work is I often hear people concerned, um, uh, certainly research is concerned about stealing, uh, people stealing your idea. The truth is, do not worry about people stealing your ideas. If your ideas are any good, you'll have to ram them down people's throats. I've really historically found this pretty true, and um, I can, I've can i been working very publicly for the last year, few years, and I really can't think of a time that uh, I published something early on, uh, um, early on in my work, say putting my analysis results up on, um, up on GitHub or another place I was able to share them, and someone scooped me, pulled the work out from, uh, from, uh, from under me. Because truth is, everyone else is working on their own stuff, and it's, um, no, one, no one is interested in taking your half-finished project. So I really would say, put your ideas out there, uh, and you might, you, might even, you might find a collaborator, but it's pretty unlikely in almost any situation, unless you have really strong reason to believe otherwise, that people are going to steal your work just because you make it public. So that concludes my advice. For, uh, for procrastinators, my three um, pieces of advice. I want to add um, one last caveat uh, to this, which is that the strategy is not just for procrastinators. Uh, I've certainly been talking about it that way because it's what works for me, but uh, if, if you don't procrastinate, this is still really terrific advice, and I know that because it worked for, um, some, uh, for someone um, uh, I work with who isn't a procrastinator. So Julia Silge uh, was um, is a uh, uh, last uh, as of 2015 was interested in making a move into data science, and as a result, she started uh, publishing a blog blog post. So she was doing public work, and uh, during the process, she was um, learning a new language R. Uh, uh, even though she was on the job market and was certainly busy for it, she was spending a lot of her time learning R. So she was sharpening her skills and using and um, using it to make public work. As a result of her public work, she got invited to an, uh, a conference called the um, R Open Sci Unconference, a hackathon of people building um, technologies, uh, building uh, R packages, and uh, that was and that was when she met me. And during and during those two days of the hackathon, we built an R package called Tidy Text. So shortly afterwards, she blogged about it, and we um, built a particular tool. And by the end of that, by uh, later in that same year, we decided to take tidy text and um, and write up a large amount of, uh, about it and start uh, pushing it as book projects, something that was important but not urgent. And out of that came our O'Reilly book, Text Mining with R. And by the end of that year, uh, we um, we got very lucky in managing to hire Julia. So she's now the second data scientist at Stack Overflow. Julie is an incredibly organized person who really does work on what she, what she wants to work on at any time, but she's embraced a lot of the same principles I talk about. And that's how I know that these kinds of ideas of working in public and improving, improving your own skills um, and really focusing on them can have amazing uh, effect on your career. If you want to read more about, uh, about Julia's career, and I really recommend you do, she has a great blog post called Non-Academic Careers for Astronomers and Physicists. So that's why I hope that everyone here, whether you are a procrastinator or not, is able, uh, is able to find some of this advice useful in your own statistics and data science career. Thank you. Particularly want to thank the, uh, the data team at Stack Overflow and the uh, EUSR for my invitation. Uh, I practice my own, uh, what I preach, so please do follow me on Twitter at DRob and uh, check out my blog at Variance Explained. Thank you so much for speaking with us, David. We will now move into the question and answer part of this session. So we have one question for you from, we believe, Asuka Javed. It's, do you recommend graduate school or PhD in computer science to sharpen programming skills and industry work in data science? 
That's a great question. Uh, the uh, so I, uh, I think it would depend on what it's compared to, or what with what alternative it's perhaps being compared to. I absolutely don't think you need to be a do a PhD in CS in order to improve uh, programming skills. It's not the only place that it can be done. Uh, so I um I think what's really important is working in a role where you do a lot of programming. So I, my own uh, PhD was in bioinformatics, and but my main job was someone would give I'd get data from other biology labs and I'd manipulate it and, and tear it apart and and run particular statistical tests on it, and that requires a ton of programming. I wouldn't have been doing any more programming if I were a computer science major. So the um so that's why I'd say I. Uh, it, it matters a lot more what project you work on than what field you're in, uh, what, what field your degree program is in. So, um, and what matters most of all is what is that you're interested in in the work. So I'd say, um, uh, so I, so I would say it does not you don't necessarily need to do a computer science degree. The one uh, except caveat I'll make to that is if you're interested in working in machine learning specifically, like um, artificial intelligence and um, and like cutting edge machine learning, like um, like neural networks, deep learning, uh, their uh, computer science often is a, um, a background in computer science is incredibly strong for that and, and a good prerequisite. Great, thank you. Um, our next question for you is, how did you um, decide to become a data scientist uh, from your sort of educational background and work background? How did you get to sort of deciding that you wanted your title to be data scientist. Well, what's amazing is that it happened like right, let's see, where is it? It happened right here. Uh, let me see, it's, here it is. It would have been January 7th, 2015. So that day, the, um, as of that day, I was interviewing for postdoctoral positions to continue being a computational biologist. Uh, but um, this this was actually that tweet was the first time I'd considered being a data being a um a data sci a data scientist. I did know that if I was going into industry, I'd I, I'd be a data scientist rather than say a software engineer. And the reason for that, so I'd say um if 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 you're inter thinking um would I be a good data scientist? Would it be something I'm interested in? I think it would be worth looking at what you enjoy about your own work and say um, what I really enjoyed is getting a data set that I that um, was in perhaps a format that I wasn't familiar with and uh, had and having someone else have questions that they wanted to answer, uh, learn about those questions from them, take apart the data, explore it, understand, um, then use t then use rigorous statistical methods to try and answer the question and then communicate those results back to them. That is a data scientist loop. That is a, a perfect, um, and, we, and if you do that again and again and again with a lot, of, with different types of data sets, uh, perhaps from other teams or perhaps um, within your own uh, work, that really is, um, that's amazing practice for being a data scientist and what data scientists do in industry. I would contrast that to what if you're really interested in doing is, is say, prove, is, um, proving mathematical theorems, you might be more interested than in, in statistics. If you're, what you're really interested in doing is building um, uh, software systems, you might be more of an, uh, of an engineer. But because I've been doing that kind of practice, uh, data science fit very naturally. Great. Thank you. Um, so the next question is, what is a typical work day like for you? So I love my typical work day because I usually uh, get to, uh, so I usually get to do, I would not say I get to do whatever I want. I would say that, um, that I have a number of problems that are, that, uh, are facing the, um, that let's say the company would want to know. We want to know, um, for example, which, uh, how can we improve, how can we improve ad revenue? How can we, um, tar how can we, uh, perhaps set up new sales leads better? And so what I do it generally is um, is I have op is I have our studio open. I would go in, sit down, pick a pro uh, pick a problem based on things set by management that are important uh, today, and start um, and start programming. So I would I would uh, I would download a data set from our data uh, from our database. I'd um, I'd tear it apart, build a large number of graphs. Every once in a while, share some graphs within the team or with other people that are that are interested, and um, and then. 
uh, and once I come up with a solution, I'd build a report and send it to them. So one big difference, uh, so a lot of that is similar to an academic scientist where you have a few projects you're working on, uh, you analyze them, uh, possibly des even design and run experiments. Um, the difference is it happens on a much faster time scale. Uh, I, the difference between getting a question asked of me and giving back uh, an ultimate answer might, might need to be shorter than a week. Uh, yeah, so so, a tip, so that would be a typical day as I write a lot of reports. And the other thing I write, as I showed earlier, is um, is blog posts. And that's whenever I find, basically whenever I find opportunities in between other things the the, the company would need from me, I would write, um, I would uh, find, in, I would just explore the data, find interesting things to um, that I can that I can pull out of it, and then uh, and start writing. Great. And then we have a question from Winifred Winifred Igbokwe. Winifred's wondering, can you get a job in statistics without a graduate degree? Oh, uh, in, uh, I'm going to assume, so, so in statistics is an interesting question. I'm, I'm going to try and answer that for, like, in data science in, um, in, in industry without a, gra without a graduate degree. Um, and, yeah, so the answer is absolutely. Uh, like, um, I certainly know people, um, no accomplished data scientists that don't have PhDs. A very rough... Um, you, you, uh, the answer is that you probably you'd start at a slightly different point. A very rough uh, idea that my team uses and a few other companies that have talked to use is that um, is that a PhD is something like um, equivalent to five years of exper of industry experience. Uh, so you might so if you um, uh, so if you immediately took a uh, took a job as a um, took a job within uh, industry at, at working in statistics, uh, the um, and, and then worked in, in roles like that for five years, you'd, you'd be at, at a similar level to someone that had, um, that had done a PhD during that time in terms of the kinds of roles you can get. Uh, so um, one th uh, master's is another, is another alternative. Certainly a master's that communicate, can get across a lot of the things that, skills that are necessary. I really want to write something about what I think is, what is, what, I think there are a lot of value to not doing a PhD, a lot of value to getting real world experience and understanding what companies need. I think it's worth a lot. So I sometimes wonder, what is the opposite? What is something you can only, in terms of experience and skill, that you can only get it from a PhD? I have a lot of thoughts on it, uh, too many to expound on here, but I'd say it sort of comes down to a scientific way of thinking, a way of being really, really good at questioning yourself and understanding exactly how you can go from a question to an answer. That's something that five years of, um, of academic research is a, is a very, very thorough way of building in those, uh, those particular patterns. Um, but to answer the question, um, yes, it's, it's absolutely possible, just a slightly different career path. Great, and then we have uh, one final question from Chinzi Chen, uh, what significant changes have been taking place in the field of statistics and data science? Well, I think the um, uh, if you take a look at two recent uh, blog posts, one on the incredible growth of um of, Py of Python, and another on the growth of R, it's really the main thing that's been changing is it's growing unbelievably rapidly, uh, particularly within like people that program and do data and do data science. Python and R are the two are Python and R are the two fastest growing programming languages uh, in terms of Stack Overflow visits, and we can tell from the data it's it's entirely because of um. Of uh, it's entirely because of data science. Data science, in some sense, is say where mobile, where programming an iPhone or an Android was 10 years ago, uh, or um, programming a website was 15 years ago. It's something that um that is incredibly rapidly growing. And as a result, I think a lot of the exciting thing that that's being figured out in it is how can you um I think the first thing is that. We assume now that data scientists can program, which wasn't really true five years ago, where there were, where there were tons and tons of analysts that didn't program. They worked with other um, types of, of, of tools like Excel. And I think the, um, as a result, a lot of the excitement in the area is built around um, uh, education tools and boot camps and, and what ways we have of getting people in, uh, educated and up to speed in the data science scene. I'm slightly over time, but I would also add that the, um, that there's uh, this is not what I work on, but there's unbelievable growth in um, in prediction uh, in the field of machine learning based on neural networks. Tensor, uh, so that's gotten a lot of press recently. But basically, um, but the but there's been a lot of revolutions in um, in say understanding uh, images and understanding images in 
um, playing games like the ability of uh, to build computers that win in Go, and in um, in targeting ads, all using these neural network technologies. We've seen so much acceleration in the last couple of years. So people more interested in machine learning, that's certainly an exciting change.